Hello, and welcome to Book Break for Greece Public Library. I'm Kirstra. I'm one of the librarians here. I moderate our Pints and Prose book discussion group. I'm joined, as always, by my very studious reader, Claire. That's right. Hi, everyone. I'm Claire. I moderate As the Page Turns book group here at the library and also our historical group on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And studious is the word of the day because it is nonfiction November. Nonfiction. I'm very excited. Yeah. Um, So let's talk a little bit. Do you read a fair amount of nonfiction, Claire, in your normal course of events? Probably. I am trying to push myself to read more. Mm -hmm. I really enjoy a good memoir. Mm -hmm. Um, And also sometimes if a topic, like I read a lot of historical fiction. So if something I read about in a fictional way interests me, I will delve into it. I may not finish the whole book, but a lot of times I like to find out the facts. Mm -hmm. And only one way to do that. And that's nonfiction. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah, I tend to read a lot of um, kind of lighter nonfiction. (laughs) So I read a lot of memoirs. And as you all know, I have particular softness for uh, celebrity memoirs. (laughs) The trashier, the better. (laughs) Nothing wrong with that. No, I need the tea. That's right. They have to spill the tea. Um, Or essays. I also love a a good book of essays, preferably humorous. Yes. Um, But I do read some, some chunkier nonfiction too and I've got I think you're a, lot, a couple of those uh, more today. ambitious than I am in that regard so well I also tend to listen to a lot of my nonfiction um for me it's it's easier sometimes because mm-hmm. you can just kind of let the sound wash over you while you're you know doing whatever you do while you listen to audiobooks washing dishes or folding laundry um and somehow that feels like a little less effort than actually sitting with one of the books and turning the pages. I don't know why that is, but yeah. yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Big fan of nonfiction on audio. Okay. I'll have to try that. Well, I've, I've done a true crime on Mm -hmm. audio before and actually I did one of my books that I'm talking about today on audio. Nice. So excellent. Well, do you want to kick us off with one of your books? I'm going to start us off with Grandma Gatewood's Walk Mm. by Ben Montgomery. And, um, I like the outdoors. So this one was an easy pick for me and I did listen to it. For those of you that are not familiar, Grandma Gatewood was a 67 year old woman in 1955 that hiked she was the first woman to hike the Appalachian Trail from Georgia to Maine. Mm-hmm. So, um, and the funny thing was, is <laughs> she's kind of the mother of ultralight hiking mm-hmm. because she literally sewed herself a little denim bag and put like a blanket, $200, some supplies in it. And that's what she struck off to hike the Appalachian Trail in. Which is a long way. Yes, yes. Um, <laughs> over... 2,000 miles. Yeah. So um, she saw an, a magazine article in National Geographic in 1949, which gave her the inspiration. And she always liked to walk. She had a very, the one thing about this book that was kind of difficult is she had a very traumatic, like abusive marriage. Mm. It was horrible. I mean, he really was abusive and would you know, injure her. And when, when the police would come, she one time was arrested for being not cooperative. I mean, horrible, horrible stuff. So um, she decides that after all her children are grown, she literally told them she was going out for a walk, <laughs> got on a bus, went to Georgia, and started the Appalachian Trail. It's a heck of a walk. Yeah. And then uh, <laughs> sent home some postcards and, mm. and so forth. Uh, so she read that only one man had um, officially walked the, the trail. And then since then, five others have achieved it, but they were all men. And she decided she was going to change that. So kudos to Grandma Gatewood, mm-hmm. you know. Um, so she started, um, like I said, she didn't have a backpack. She didn't have a sleeping bag. She stopped along the way to replenish her supplies. Sometimes she would go knock on doors. <laughs> And, you know, people would feed her. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't know if you could do it in the same way now as, as back then, but maybe they're, you know, mm-hmm. I don't know if people along the trail are so helpful and everything. But 
Um, she broke three pairs of glasses, <laughs> one through seven <laughs> pairs of tennis shoes, um, had to be carried across like a raging river. Uh, one of the my favorite stories was about she stopped at one of the um, shelters and it had been like a hurricane, so mm-hmm. there was tons and tons of rain, and a swing the stream was too swollen for her to go forward. So it was a pretty f- full shelter. It was eight young men. They were all black and and um, like a counselor. Come to find out, they were from a church in. Um, Harlem, Mm -hmm. they were four members each of two rival gangs that they had sent to the Appalachian Trail to try to get them to... Like a diversion program? Yeah, to work together. Hmm. Um, So she, you know, stayed in the shelter with them, which I thought was really cool, and both her diary mentions it, and also um, the man that brought the group of boys mentioned it, and mentioned how some of them had to carry her, like, across the stream, and she was, like, almost choking them because, you know, she was so (laughs) frightened she couldn't swim. Mm. Um, but, you know, she comes across copperheads, rattlesnakes. You know, she, she flicks away a rattlesnake with her walking stick. It was, it was just a, a really interesting read, you mm-hmm. know. Um, and for someone that likes the outdoors, I would highly recommend this book. So it's not just entertaining. It was inspiring. And I loved it because at the end she said, I did it. I said I would do it. And I've done it. So she stood at the top of, is it Mount Cahocton, and sang like the first verse of America the Beautiful, <laughs> went and signed the register, and, and that was it. And then later on, she went and hiked it again two more times. That's what I thought, yeah. She also hiked the Pacific Crest Trail. Okay. This woman started this at 67. That's you amazing. Know, she averaged 17 miles a day. In the end, when it got really cold and everything, she was only averaging about eight. But still, you Mm -hmm. know, that's that's incredible. Yeah, Um, it is. And it's a lot of that trail is very rugged. Right. Like, it's not easy And then it was even even worse. Like, Mm -hmm. she kind of started the movement to kind of, like, make the trail, like, more accessible for Mm -hmm. people. Um, But, yeah, 2,550 miles, 13 states... Uh, she lost 30 pounds too, like uh, yeah, doing this. Yeah, I would so, guess. <laughs> yeah, but um, really, really interesting book. I yeah. liked it a lot. Nice. That would be an interesting uh, companion read to um, Wild by Cheryl yeah. Strayed yeah. about hiking the Pacific Crest Trail. Who was also unprepared, kind of, you know, really. Yes, but yeah. in like, like an opposite way. Like she right. had this giant pack with everything in it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So very cool. Yeah. Nice. Um, all right. So my, my first one, I have, um, two pretty serious books and one less serious, and I'm going to start with my more serious and, um, end on a lighter note. I think. So my first one is Empire of Pain, the secret history of the Sackler dynasty by Patrick Radden Keefe. So Patrick Radden Keefe was also the author of Say Nothing, which was the book about the troubles in Northern Ireland that I talked about a million years ago um, that I really enjoyed. So when this book came out, it went immediately on my list, and then it sat there for, I don't know, a year and a half. But you're still getting another one off your stack of shame. That's right. Um, So this one had been sitting for a long time, and I finally you know, made the push to actually get it. I listened to this one. Um, it was very good as an audio book. And you know what? I actually listened to all three of these. Hmm. Um, so Empire of Pain is, as it says, the story of the Sackler family. Um, so the progenitors of this family, the like oldest generation that where we pick up the story, um, are three brothers, Arthur, Mortimer, and Raymond Sackler. Arthur is the oldest. He was born in 1913 in Brooklyn to uh, Jewish immigrant parents. So they're first generation Americans. Um, and they're a fascinating family. So the book is roughly divided in half. And about the first half is just kind of talking about the family um, and what they were like. And that all sets the stage for what comes next. So Arthur Sackler, of the three brothers, was probably the most 
driven and ambitious. Mm -hmm. He went to work when he was still in elementary school. So he was going to school and then working a job like in the afternoons and evenings. It was 19, like the 1920s. Okay. You did that then, yeah. I guess. Or it wasn't a big deal. Right. Um, Child labor laws were probably yeah. not quite the same. So this is a man who always had a side hustle. Okay. Like even when he was working full time, he had at least one side hustle going and usually a couple. Um, and... He and both of his brothers became medical doctors. Uh, so three brothers, three medical doctors. Um, and all three had an interest in um, psychiatry and mental health. Um, and I think all three of them worked for a time at a psychiatric hospital. So as they're doing their doctoring thing, Arthur um, also gets into... Um, editing medical journals, which will become important later. Um, and they also purchase together, they invest together in a drug company. Hmm. Hmm. And so it begins. So the really fascinating thing is how they kept a lot of these side hustles kind of on the DL from everyone. So people may have known that Arthur was working full time for um, this drug company. Oh, and he also had um, an advertising agency that specialized in drug advertising Go and figure. kind of pioneered yeah. drug advertisements as we know of them today. So there's a whole lot of like self-dealing and behind the scenes stuff that's happening. So, and through all of this, the three brothers are just getting richer and richer and richer. Um, <coughs> and one of the things that, one of the themes through here that kind of seems to drive the family, at least in this generation, is um, the need to be seen as like legitimate. Um, and to have kind of a name in, like, the old money circles of New York. Everybody so, always wants to get into old money circles. Mm -hmm. So that's when <coughs> the Sackler family starts um, really getting serious about philanthropy. Okay. So they endowed chairs at various universities um, and medical schools. They have their name on or did on several schools of medicine. Um, and they also were very interested in art and specifically Asian art. So there was the <coughs> Sackler wing of the right. Metropolitan Art Museum in New York, which was their Asian art wing. Um, and all over the place. So all over the country and then into Europe, they were just donating money and putting their name on everything. Um, and some of this was, you know, the trying to make themselves look important and established. And some of it was just trying to make themselves look just legitimate um, as business people and philanthropists. So that's kind of the first half of the book. Um, and then Arthur Mortimer and Raymond all have their own families. And the next generation starts taking over some of these businesses, um, including the company of um, Purdue Pharma. So this is their um, drug company, drug manufacturing. Um, and Purdue Pharma were the creators of OxyContin. So that's the second half of the book. Um, and we really need the first half to set up kind of the family dynamics to really help you understand why Purdue handled OxyContin the way that it did. So the big, um, the big issue with OxyContin is the way that it was so aggressively marketed to doctors um, and to patients and um, the fact that it was being abused and had the potential to be abused from the very beginning and did the family know? And did they actively cover up that information? Since they also wrote journals. Since they also wrote medical journals and they were doing the advertising 
like, and they were doing the marketing. Like, it all ties back in together. Right. So, and the end, as we know it, is the opioid epidemic in the United States. Um, so the book goes all the way through that, through um, the lawsuits against the Sackler family brought by a couple of states um, in the late 20-teens um, and the kind of forward look to what is what will the future hold for this family and for their companies. So it is a very sobering read. Um, and at first, the the first half just about the family, I was like, well, this is this is all interesting, but like, why do we care? But then when you get into the dynamics of what happened with Purdue Pharma and with OxyContin, it makes a lot more sense. You need to have that backstory to understand the dynamics that were at play. Okay. So it's a fascinating book, um, difficult subject matter, but... Um, a really kind of engaging look at it that left me understanding a lot more about the opioid epidemic and how it happened and why. Okay. So, yeah. It's been on a lot of, like, best of lists. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Interesting. I think he, he just came out with another book, too. Mm -hmm. uh, called Rogues. Yeah. Yeah. So. That's well, an that's an automatic on the list for me. Yeah, I, I that would be even something I might handle because mm -hmm. it's about like criminals and yeah, yeah, yeah. So absolutely. All right, my next one is <coughs> Inheritance, and I actually mm. read this because I went to Kirsten's Pints and Prose, um, but after I read this book, I really was like, I have got to talk to people about this book. Mm -hmm. um, and not everyone loved it as much as I did, but mm -hmm. I actually really liked that book. I thought it was a great book discussion choice. And the setup is is um, Danny Shapiro took a DNA test pretty much on a lark mm -hmm. and found out that her father was not her biological father. Um, so this book will take the reader on a journey through ancestry, what love and family actually mm -hmm. mean. Uh, and then we go into the secrecy of sperm donation, the ethics uncovered years later when suddenly, you know, there's readily and available DNA testing mm -hmm. that probably blew a hole into quite a few families, I'm thinking. Uh, but I particularly love the conversations she had with her father's rabbi and her father's sister. They were just so moving. But I, I think... Like for Danny, she was raised in a very orthodox mm -hmm. Jewish family, a very prominent mm -hmm. orthodox Jewish family. It was a enormous part of her identity. Yeah. Um, so, you know, her, here you have this family. The thing about her is she always, even as a young child, kind of wondered about herself and how she fit in because she was blonde haired and blue eyed. There was no one in her family or all her cousins or anyone else that looked like her. Um, her mother actually took her one time and she was a model for like a Kodak Christmas ad, which kind of was <laughs> kind of funny, but, um, but you know, she, she loved going to church with her father. That was just a huge part of who she was. She mm -hmm. also lost her parents, um, her father, very early because of a tragic car accident. Mm -hmm. And I believe her mother died of complications, what, five, ten years later? Something like, like not, that. It wasn't yeah. immediate. But mm -hmm. um, So she had lost both her parents. She had, a, was it a half-sister? Mm -hmm. Yes, because yep. her, her father, I believe, had been married twice, right? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, she and she got oh you don't look Jewish and she got some kind of really you know odd or demeaning things said to her mm -hmm. quite a bit because people you know she didn't match up to what they thought her expectations of her family were. So um, she goes on this quest to after she finds out you know she's from a different family she finds her biological father. Mm -hmm. So then the second half of the book is really. Will she meet him? How is this going to go? And 
to me, it ended on a very hopeful note, but mm-hmm. yet there, it did bring up a lot of questions. Like her father ended up being a medical doctor that did sperm donation, you know, to make some extra money during mm-hmm. medical school. Yep. And I'm sure he wasn't alone. There were probably a lot of people. So, yeah. um, and then she began to wonder, like, did my parents know they did this? You know, and that's one reason why she went to the rabbi and she went to relatives because there was like a moral dilemma there for her. Like, how could my parents have done this and not told me? Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, apparently her mom was really, really, really wanted to be a mother. And back then in the early 60s, what did you do? So she went to someone who promised results that got results yeah she got results (laughs) and like she used to tell danny yes you're my only child but Mm -hmm. i hit the jackpot with you miracle baby my miracle baby you know which she sure was so um so yeah it was a it was a big kind of identity crisis and it does bring up a lot of questions like how are people going to handle that in the future and that was the one thing her father even when he did meet her you know was like i'm not sure i'm going to keep going with this Mm -hmm. because there's probably more of them out there you know so yeah yeah but i i thought it was really really interesting i would definitely like to read more by her i think danny shapiro just came out with a new fiction book oh interesting like for she's maybe started in fiction and then did a lot of different memoirs she's written several memoirs yeah Yeah. so um it'll be interesting to see what her fiction book is like yeah but i liked her writing style Mm -hmm. and um some people you know thought she was whiny but I, I think for knowing other people of, you know, with this heritage, I can see why that was a big deal for her. Yeah, it was profoundly destabilizing. Yes. Yeah. You know, even though it was like, they were like, oh, she's 50 some years old. Get over it. You know, mm-hmm. but I'm like, mm, no, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The thing that I thought was, or one of the things that I thought was super interesting about the book was when she was talking about that sense of alienation that she had even as a child. And I couldn't help but wonder like how much of that was that there were these like real biological differences between her and her father and how much of it was the fact that her parents were keeping this kind of poisonous secret and it infected like every part of their relationship. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. The one thing though, that it was really cool though at the like at the end when Mm -hmm. she talked to the father sister um the aunt said i'm not going to give up on you if you're not going to give Mm -hmm. up on me and kind of indicated that no matter what her actual Mm -hmm. biological tie to their family was family is family she was her Mm -hmm. she was family yeah yeah i thought that was a really nice nice ending Mm -hmm. so i agree yeah i liked that one a lot too oh good yeah All right. Um, My next title is How the Word is Passed by Clint Smith, uh, subtitle A Reckoning with the History of Slavery Across America. Um, Clint Smith is a poet. This is his first work of nonfiction um, after publishing, I think, a couple of books of poetry and a new book of poetry out fairly recently. Um, But this book... Is set up, it's so interesting, the setup of it. Basically, he goes to nine, di- one, two, three, four, five, six, six places in the U.S. and one um, place abroad. And each of those places has some tie to the history of slavery in mm-hmm. the U.S. And what he's looking at is how each of those places interprets its history having to do with slavery or not like how as as it says a reckoning with the history of slavery how they kind of parse that history to tell the story of the place um and so part of it's like partly this road trip across the u.s um which i have (laughs) my own personal history i don't know if i've talked about this before on book break but we used to go every summer Um, we would do like a road trip to family and our vacation, the vacation part of that was stopping at like historic sites (laughs) along the way. Um, my mom is a huge, uh, history buff. So anything related to the revolutionary war or the civil war, 
Like, I've been to that battlefield and that historic home. <laughs> like, anywhere between, like, Rochester and Baltimore and Virginia. So, that whole swing, Gettysburg. Oh, you got a lot to oh, visit there's, down yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot. Um, so, I've spent a lot of time in a lot of these um, historic places. Um, so the first place that he visits is Monticello, which was Thomas Jefferson's plantation in Virginia. Um, I've been there too. Mm -hmm. um, and he also visits the Whitney plantation in, I think it's in Mississippi, Angola prison in Louisiana, Blandford Cemetery, Galveston Island, New York City, and Goree Island in Senegal. So each of those places has some very deep tie to the history of slavery in the U.S. And they kind of tell that history in very different ways. Um, and he talks a lot just about public history and how we as a country also grapple with this kind of information and historical truth right? Like what's history? What's fact? What is truth? What are the stories that we tell about ourselves? Right. Um, I started reading a book that was very similar. Mm -hmm. I think it's called Deep South. It's okay. Like, um, yeah. But she also went to different places and mm -hmm. did the same thing. I couldn't talk about it because I didn't finish it. Yeah. Um, but it was really interesting. Yeah. Um, so he, in, in all of these places, he interacts with people there, whether it is tour guides, um, other tourists on tours, um, people who are just visiting at the same time, um, and has a lot of very interesting conversations that he relates. And I've got to say, Clint Smith, like, he will strike up a conversation with anybody in places where I would be like, oh, I don't think you want to start talking to that person but he you know he's he's very open um and you can tell that in his approach to other people which was fascinating um did you know that new york city had the second largest slave market in the u.s no yeah yeah which i didn't know either yeah. like that's that's a true fact um and, you know, it's not something that I learned about as or in New York public schools. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so there's a lot here to grapple with. Um, and then Goree Island in Senegal is um, famously a place where um, enslaved Africans were gathered before they were put onto the ships to come to North America. Okay. So it's kind of that, that last stop in Africa before they really became enslaved people in, in the U.S. Um, so it's fascinating. So he's a poet. The language is beautiful. Um, the author reads the book in the audio, um, and it's, it's just excellent. Um, there's a lot here to think about and things that like really stuck with me for a long time. Um, highly, highly recommend to anyone who's interested in U S history, public history in general, and the history of slavery okay. is just fantastic. That sounds interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I am going to go back and revisit that book that I started. So <laughs> yeah, maybe on a future, future episode. I'd be interested to hear about it. <clears throat> All right, so my last one, I'm going to take us in a totally, mm. totally different direction. Um, we're going off the charts here, people, because I, I am doing um, I'm Glad My Mom <gasps> Died by Jeanette McCurdy. Yeah, I'm not excited because you're glad your mom died. No. I'm excited that you're talking about this book because it's, it's this, everywhere right Yeah, now. this book has been everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it sold out of its first printing like almost immediately. Yeah. Uh, I was lucky to, I think you purchased more copies and my hold finally <laughs> came in. Uh, the funny thing is, is I never remember watching iCarly or mm -hmm. Sam and Cat or any of this, the shows that, you know, this, this mm -hmm. actress was in. Um, I just like a good memoir. Mm -hmm. So this one, um, it starts 
with the a young adult Jeanette McCurdy hovering over her mom's body. Her mom is now like in the final stages of cancer. Jeanette is probably about 21, and, th- and she and her siblings are all going up and saying something meaningful to her, hoping to trigger some kind of response. Mm. So what Jeanette says to her is, Mom, I'm finally down to 89 pounds, which was her goal weight for her. And, I, and, and then that's <laughs> what rockets you into this memoir. There's so much wrong with that. Oh. We can't even stop here because we'll be here the rest of the day. So you, you, you can't even imagine how much there, oh was, my God. there was wrong with this mm-hmm. book, Kirstra. Um, it was so eye-opening. So first of all, she grew up in a Mormon family, okay, where mom had cancer multiple times and mm. would use this to kind of manipulate. Her mother definitely was a narcissist. Um, Mom had dreamed of being an actress, believed Jeanette was her only daughter. So when Jeanette was very young, her mom began to push her into Mm. that career. By the time she was six years old, she's going to auditions. She's taking acting classes, singing lessons, dancing lessons, you name it. Um, Her mom was also extremely manipulative. She had a horrible relationship with her husband, She was a hoarder. Like, they couldn't even sleep in their own bedrooms because there was stuff piled everywhere. So they would have, like, apportioned mats in the living room where they all stayed. Oh, my God. Um, (laughs) She had an extremely unhealthy relationship with her daughter, uh, particularly about food and weight. But she was controlling to the point where she would bathe and shower and do her hair until she was at least, like, 18. No, 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 yeah, that's no, not done. No, 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 so, no, 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 no. Um, <laughs> yeah, and physical exams. Yeah, I mean, mm. the thing was, is the I thought this was going to be something different than it was because okay. it says, like, on the cover, like a hilarious, you know, memoir. And I'm like, this isn't hilarious, this is trauma, pure and mm-hmm. simple. Like, she is funny. It's a very dark humor and mm-hmm. some things. But by the time you get to the end, literally, I was having to put it down going, okay, uh, mm. I got to take a little break here, you know, because, um, you know, Jeanette just continues to spiral into, you know, bulimia and food things and trying to control her weight and then alcohol addiction and, mm-hmm. you know, just forming unhealthy relationships. Oh, and that's another side <laughs> because, uh, you know, iCarly and Kat and Sam were on the Nickelodeon network where mm-hmm. I'm thinking, oh, Nickelodeon, Rugrats, you know, fun shows, kids love it. No, 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 people, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, these child actors and actresses are parceled out, abused, manipulated, just, yeah. oh, oh, it's... Uh, so for me, I would never find it hilarious. There were parts mm. that were funny. It was very eye-opening. Um, and it is a bit hopeful in the end because she begins to really understand the scope of her problems, and especially after her mom died because her own identity was so merged into pleasing her mother and making her mother happy and she felt bad because her mother was sick so she was Mm -hmm. the one that could make her mother happy you know by doing everything plus the fact that this poor child was paying the bills like if they Mm -hmm. needed a new refrigerator man hustle Jeanette out there onto that street get her a few gigs or you know um before she got her tv series like commercials or small Mm -hmm. bit parts or whatever you know um, so yeah, they were all, she was, they were all dependent financially upon her, mm-hmm. you know? So, um, yeah, but some of the things the mom would say to her, like your eyelashes are so clear. Don't you think that Dakota Fanning? Yeah, she tints her eyelashes. So we are too, you know? <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. It mm. was, it was something. It mm-hmm. really was. Yeah. It's been interesting since that book has come out, there's been kind of a broader discussion happening in pop culture and social media about 
child actors mm-hmm. and how they're treated and you know some of the stuff that went on at Nickelodeon yeah um and people are going back and looking at some of the like Disney kids Lindsay Lohan Britney Spears and like you know so, well Selena Go- uh, the Selena list goes Gomez. on and yeah, on it goes, and on it does yeah and um Will Wheaton has actually talked a lot about very openly about um his childhood and abuse from his parents and his experience of child stardom, which was not anything that he ever wanted. Right. Um, so it's all kind of part of that same conversation, which is Well, that was, that really was the thing that she never really wanted to be an actress either. Right. She liked writing. And mm-hmm. now that's kind of what she is getting into. She also does a podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And she did a stage show, I believe, by oh, the same name. Okay. Uh, kind of. As part of, I think, her own therapy to get mm-hmm. through what she'd been through. So, um, yeah, yeah, it was. It, I, I'm glad I read it, mm-hmm. and I, I can see why. You know, in the cover, you know, with it's that hysterical. Yeah, well, that's it leads you to like, you know, she's kind of smirking, and she's got that pink urn. So yeah, <laughs> it's just. Like, <laughs> yeah. Um, I was thinking it, it was going to have some uh, sad and unhappy parts, but mm-hmm. I didn't realize it would be as traumatic as it was. It. it kind of reminded me a bit of, you know, educated. Mm. Same level of trauma. Okay. Really. Same level of family. Okay. And that book made me furious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it wasn't that bad. Okay. Um, because that the brother and everything, yeah. her brothers, <laughs> you know, weren't yeah. like that. But, um. But yeah, and I wanted, I wanted, she never mentioned the man that was the show, they called, she called The showrunner? Yeah, the creator. Mm. So he was never named, but um, I think if you do a Google search, you can probably figure that out pretty quickly. But she had a relationship with a much older man Mm -hmm. for a while and just, oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, that one's been on my list. I think it's still on my list, but I'm actually glad to know a little bit more what I'm walking into because yeah. I think I would have thought the same thing as you initially thought. Right. The the balance of humor to pathos was going to tip a little more towards humor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I didn't that was not the case for me. Yeah. Yeah. So, interesting. Yeah. All right. But definitely well written, definitely mm-hmm. very engaging, but okay. Um, another coworker here also like, you know, you have to put it down for a while, you know, it's like, Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So. All right. Interesting. Yeah. All right. Well, my last book is a little more humorous than my other two. It is, we came, we saw, we left a family gap year by Charles Whelan, uh, subtitle nine months, six continents, Three teenagers. Oh. Indeed. So Leah and Charlie Whelan are um, parents living in New Hampshire. Um, He is a professor at Dartmouth. She is um, a school teacher or involved in um, education. And they have three children between the ages of 12 and 18, CJ, Sophie, and Katrina. And they decide. um, So Leah and Charlie did kind of a big travel together as um, young people. So after college, they met in college, and after college, they went traveling together. And as their kids are getting older, and their oldest is graduating from high school and getting ready to maybe go off to college, she's been accepted to college, um, they decide they want to give that experience to their kids of this big travel. Um, So they do. Katrina takes a gap year from school. She defers her admission. Um, CJ and Sophie, they essentially work out like a homeschooling Mm -hmm. scheme (laughs) for the, for the year that they're going to miss so that they don't lose any time in school. And they take nine months to travel the world. Um, So this is ambitious on a number of levels. <laughs> so the amount of time and planning involved, like nine months is a long time to leave your life. Yeah, and five people. And five people. Um, and there were some 
other folks like thrown in. There's a little bit of a rotating cast of um, young people with them, but traveling with three teenagers for that long is yeah, it's a not a choice of, many people <laughs> as a mother that you know had three teenagers at yeah. one time. Yeah, I'm yeah, not sure I would. Do you want to be with them nonstop for nine months? Yeah, <laughs> on planes, trains, and buses. Um, so it's very interesting. They he does talk a little bit at the beginning about um, how they funded their trip, um, and does acknowledge that you know not everyone is in a place of privilege to be able to do this. He's like, but it's cheaper than you think. I'm like, hmm. Um, so basically they've worked out that they need about 60% of nine months of income to fund this trip, like what their normal income would be. And again, that's not a choice that everyone's going to be able to make. Um, but he's like, it, it's not quite as much as you think. And then once you're actually out in the world, like you can get by on a lot less money than you think you need. Um, but then it just gets very funny in the way, um, it reminded me a lot of Bill Bryson mm -hmm. and his travel writing. Um, so there's a lot of humor in the book. Um, you kind of have to find the humor again when you're traveling with three teenagers and you're all together all the time. Um, but two of the kids at one point like get lost in Colombia in the, the subway system. Um, they have all of these adventures. There is maybe a brush with flesh eating bacteria Ugh. at one point. Okay. <laughs> um, but then they also do some amazing things and see some amazing things. They climb Machu Picchu and they do a midnight dive in the Great Barrier Reef and all of these like amazing experiences that you know, otherwise you would never have. Right. Right. So I'm not a traveler nearly to this extent, but I do enjoy travel. And that really appealed to me, like the idea of having all of these experiences as a family. Um, I think it appeals more in theory than it would in practice yeah. <laughs> for me, but, um, but it is funny. And he does talk about like how they get like crabby with each other, on these, on the trip. And, you know, they have to come up with strategies for, you know, like these two are the introverts and they need to spend time like writing in journals and doing these things. And CJ is the extrovert who basically never stops talking. So they need to have someone for CJ to talk to so that he can be occupied. And, you know, so there's a lot of that. Do um, they travel in like a, a vehicle or? So they, get around a lot of different ways. And one of the things that was interesting to me is how much of their trip was just kind of loosey goosey. Okay. So they had a few fixed points, like they had plane tickets um, booked for the start of the trip and like a couple plane tickets at various points. But then the rest of it was like trains and buses, um, hired buses occasionally. Um, but usually it was some version of public transit and they would just like get the train that came when they wanted to go and they would move on to the next city. Um, he doesn't spend as much time talking about the destinations as most travel writers do. So I wouldn't necessarily consider this a true travel book. Okay. Um, there's a lot more, it's more of a memoir. So it's more about their family and and the family dynamics and that kind of thing. And then the different places are kind of a backdrop to the little family drama. Okay. Um, there is drama with like visas and passports, like all this stuff. And they're very... Um, laid back about a lot of it and I think you have to be to travel that way like this is definitely not a how-to guide for every person to take their family around the world <laughs> right like this worked for their family um it wouldn't necessarily work for everyone but it was it, parts of it were very funny um the dynamic between Charlie and CJ is pretty funny um and yeah 
the one thing I will say is I listened to this one and I did not care for the narrator. So I would recommend if you're going to pick this one up, pick up the print copy so that you can hear your own voices in your head and not the narrator who was very irritating. Did not like. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. That's what I got. Awesome. Well, hopefully we got some nonfiction. We got quite a variety here. Mm -hmm. So so hopefully you will find something that you are interested in reading. Absolutely. And if you've read any of these, um, we would love to hear your take on any of the books that we've talked about. Especially, um, I feel like we have the most traction probably with I'm Glad My Mother Died. I'm sure there are some of you who have already picked that one up and read it. Right. So tell us what you think. We want to know. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. All right. Well, we will be back in a couple of weeks with a roundup. Um, Until then, again, let us know what you're reading, what you think about it, and please do subscribe to our podcast anywhere that you listen to podcasts. Yep, and if you think of it, drop us a review or a rating and let us know how we're doing. Absolutely. All right. Thanks, everyone, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. See you soon. Book Break is a production of the Grease Public Library, made possible through the support of the Friends of the Grease Public Library. Theme music composed and performed by Sean Greif.